you will, go ahead and open your Bibles now to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're to begin in verse 19. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. However, I don't believe that you can actually begin verse 19 without uh, failing to appreciate what verse 18 says. And in, I hope you've got your Bibles open there. I didn't put verse 18 on the screen because I really want you to not just rely on it. I want you to think for just a moment. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Think about that for just a minute. The sufferings of this present time, what do you suppose Christians living in Rome were enduring during the time Paul writes the book of Romans? Okay. Perhaps Nero, perhaps earlier than Nero, but... Uh, we're not certain about the exact date, but Christians were suffering as a result of their being Christians. The question is, is it worth it? When will you and I know it's worth it? When you get to heaven with a glory that shall be revealed in us. So if you would assume everything that follows in verse 19 would have some relation to what verse 18 was trying to stress. So verses 19 going through about verse 25 is a passage that has recently been, I would say, misused among many of our preachers. And uh, there is a doctrine that is currently known as the renovated earth doctrine. Let me explain to you what's taking place. There are several preachers who are teaching now, again, some of them among us, that what happened, Jesus will come back to this earth, and rather than this earth being destroyed, this earth is going to be renovated. And that rather than us going to heaven to live with God, we're going to live here on this earth on a renovated earth. And that it will be a physical earth. And uh, many of them will say that the best tomato that you've ever had in your life will be a part of the renovated earth. The best golf game that you've ever played will be on the golf course on a renovated earth. And you may think I'm exaggerating this. I assure you I am not. Uh, you can listen to several who, by the time you get through talking, you're thinking, well, everything's here? Everything's all about this earth? Well, let me take this section through here and try to just understand it properly. I'm going to read verses 19 through verse 25, and then I'm going to come back beginning with verse 19. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for our adoption or the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one hope for what he still sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, um, let's go back to verse 19 for just a second here. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The question is, what is this creation? Or if you're reading the original King James, the creature. What is the creation? What is the creature? The creature would be man, and the creation would be mankind, the culmination of God's divine activity. 
You remember, God created this earth, and when he got to day six and he created man, then that's the culmination because God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over fish of the sea, the birds of the air. You know, God's culmination. You remember in Psalm 8, David asked, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him, and crown him with glory and honor? And basically put him over everything that you have. Now, uh, but those people who hold the renovated view, earth view say that the creation includes the cows, includes the bugs, includes the rocks, and the trees. That's true, especially the inanimate objects. And, but they're saying that, you know, what happened is that the fall of man messed up everything. And because of the fall of man, they're waiting for Jesus to come back and renovate this earth. That's what they're all eagerly waiting for. Well, now let's look here at this phrase here that we find in verse 19. The creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. If I read verse 18 correctly, where he speaks about the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, what are we looking for? What are we eagerly waiting for? Heaven. That's a part of all that this life is about, is what we're eagerly waiting for. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about in just a minute that phrase, eagerly waiting, because it's found three times in this context, verse 19, verse 23, and verse 25. But it's also found in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, where he says, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also found in Hebrews 9 and verse 28 where it says, For Christ also suffered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus is going to come back again. And what am I excited about when he comes? What am I eagerly waiting for? It's certainly not this body. It's certainly not this physical, and I made a comment to one of the persons who holds this view. I said, it's amazing to me that most of you people who hold this view are young, you're enthusiastic, you have a lot of good health, you love to go hiking, you love nature. I said, I'm glad that you do, but I said, let yourself get a few years on you. And your physical body doesn't always react the way that you want it to. And your perception of life may change. I'm not looking for this old body to be renovated. Exactly. You know, that's, uh, you know, everything in this life is vanity and striving after wind. In fact, that's where we get to this being subjected. Let's go on to verse 20 because... Willie's brought up a point, which is, is certainly valuable here, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly because of him who subjected it in hope. Uh, creation was subjected to futility. What's the word futility or vanity is the original King James? What does that word mean? Useless. Uh, what do you mean to say that this... Uh, the creation of man was subjected to uselessness or to vanity or to nothingness. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He says there that uh, man who is born, he lives, he dies, and then, you know, he's no more. That's his creation. That's what we're a part of this physical creation here. Well, then why am I, what am I looking for? He subjected it in hope. Hope for what? What he just spoke about in verse 18, that the glory that shall be revealed in us. So he says, because the creation itself also would be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Talking about being delivered from and talking about the corruption, what is corruption? Decay. What happens to everything in this earth of this creation? 
created. Yeah. And, uh, but what happens is this old body grows old. It dies. Plants grow old. They die. Everything grows old and dies. And it's a part of the, what we would call the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, it's. Yeah, everything is here as a part of a, as a cycle here. But he says this glorious liberty of the sons of God, of the children of God, he's looking forward to something where this corruptible world will no longer be corruptible. Do you remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says? This corruptible put, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I, I just don't understand the concept of saying, I want to live here on a renovated earth. Uh, of course, I think there's one passage that settles it completely, fully, and forever. Well, 2 Peter 3.10, but they argue about that one. I think it's John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or literally many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, don't skip over that. I go to prepare a place for you. If I say, I go, he says, then he says, I will come again receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I don't think you can get past that. You talking about the uh, premillennialist? The premillennialists believe that Jesus will come back and reign on this earth for a thousand years, and during that thousand years, they're going to get to reign like kings. And uh, I think it's based in materialism. I believe those people who hold to the renovated earth view are also materialists. They're caught up into the material things here on earth. And, uh, but the focus, I think, has to be not on here, but on there, where Jesus has prepared a place for us. Peter chapter 3. Well, the original word there used for burned up can also be translated found out. It, it, well, that's the problem, you know. They want to focus on that one word rather than on the, everything that's around about. It. You know, the, the earth will be dissolved, the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works, and it will be burned up. And their idea is, yes, it will go through a cleansing process, but they believe that it will be a renovated earth that's going to come back better than ever, just for the righteous, though. Go ahead, Joe, and then I'll get Leonard. But he says the earth and the works in it. So that's going to that include both. Well, let me get Leonard and then I'll get you with it. Uh. Well, I have no doubt that heaven's going to be a place beyond all of our comprehension. And that's the reason why John in his description in Revelation, you know, talks about streets of gold, pearly gates, takes the things that are the most beautiful here on earth and then translates them to our understanding to try to describe, even though we recognize that's not, you know, there's not going to be a sea made out of physical glass, but it's like glass. Really, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, this earth has no purpose once the Lord has 
destroyed it. I mean, heaven is the, the hope of the home of those who are saved. Let me go on to verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. That key word that Paul has used now going all the way back to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 8. He says the whole creation, not just part of the whole creation. You remember when Jesus gave the great commission in Mark chapter 16, he says, go there for it and preach the gospel to the whole creation, to every creature. That includes both Christian and non-Christian. The whole creation is every human being. Well, what does it mean to say that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs? What is the, what's the picture he's given? I mean, what's the, the figure of speech? Woman about to give birth of a child. And when she's getting ready to give birth, what does she do? You guys who've been there with your wives and you women, what does a woman go through when she's getting ready to give birth? Pain, suffering. Um, I told Coretta I thought when Mark was born that those metal bars, she was going to bend them uh, because she was in such excruciating pain that, uh, you know, the, the, the pain is just overwhelming. What he's looking at, he's saying, that's the way the world is. This world is not a beautiful place. Uh, you can say, well, there, there's some beautiful things in creation. You know, waterfalls, the ocean, uh, beautiful trees and flowers. But when you look at the humankind, is it a very beautiful place? What, what do you think about the way our world is right now? I don't know if, how many of you know that uh, Iran decided last night that they would fire about 150 rockets and cruise missiles into Israel. What, what, what kind of world are we living in? It's a violent world. It's a sin-filled world, much like was described when Noah was around, isn't it? And what it is the whole creation crying out for? For it to be over. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to verse 23 then. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. Notice now, he's talked about the whole creation, but now he comes to a, a part of it, and that is those who are Christians. He says, we also have the first fruit of the spirits, even we ourselves grown within ourselves. That goes back to verse 18. The sufferings of this present time, are we ourselves going through difficulty, whether it is by persecution or by old age, wanting the redemption of the body? If I were to ask everybody who's over 60, how many aches and pains do you have right now? How do you think we didn't have enough time here today for everybody to talk about how much aches and pains we're going through? <laughs> but he's looking at those Christians who were suffering, and he says, we ourselves, we groan, within ourselves. Now, he describes those, we who have received the first fruits of the Spirit, that is, we're the first ones who become Christians. We're the ones who are walking by the Spirit. You know, he says, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's the earlier part in chapter 8. So we're, we understand who he's talking about here. But we're eagerly waiting the adoption, that is, the redemption of our bodies. You know, how much would you enjoy being able to have a spiritual body that does not have any sort of corruption in it? 
You don't have any arthritis. You don't have any uh, torn ligaments. You don't have any broken bones. You don't have diabetes. You don't have high blood pressure. You don't have all of these physical maladies of life that it's, it's all gone. You know, Paul or John, when he describes in the book of Revelation there at the end, he says there'll be no more sickness, no sorrow, no dying, no pain. The former things have what? Passed away. And it's important for us to see that what he's talking about here is the people who are focused on the renovated earth are focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing on the earth when... Paul is focused on the person. And that's the context here. Well, if you're reading Hebrews, you know, where he's talking about particularly what the Christians are suffering, he says, you have joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. You know, uh, you work hard, you get a lot. Let's say you go out and you buy your new car. Well, back then, you go out and you buy your new chariot. You go buy your new horse. And then all of a sudden, someone says, because you're a Christian, I'm going to take that away from you. What does that tell you about this life? What does it tell you about physical things? It all passes. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where your heart, your treasure is there where your heart be also. Well, the word redemption literally means to buy back again. And I, I would tend to think there's probably in this the thought of where man was prior to the fall. Uh, prior to the fall, man had the right to the tree of life. The next time you read about the tree of life is in Revelation 22 when he talks about being in heaven and the picture there. So I, I would say that the thought is we get to go back and be where we once were in the sense of we go back to a state of innocence. We go back to a state of where there's, there's not death. There's, there's all the life. Uh, but the redemption of the body is, is the fact that when Jesus, you know, comes to, uh, like he rose from the dead, we'll rise from the dead. Now, if somebody says, well, I want to know what that body's going to be like. First John chapter 3, verse 2, we has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be even as he is. In other words, I don't know what the body's going to look like. That's beyond my comprehension. But I know when Jesus comes again, but I do know that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, he says that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So there's going to, he says, goes on to say, hold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment of the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. So there will be a change take place. What will that be? What will I look like? Will I look like my former younger self or will I look like my older self? I don't know. But I do know that there will be a time when uh, there will be this great change. Well, let's go to verse 24. Verse 24 is important in this context because if you go back to verse um, 23, he's talking about what's focused on, he says, is this, and he says, for we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he's in? Four times in that one verse. What is hope? Not wishful thinking, a certain confident expectation, knowing that God always keeps his promises. 
We are saved in this hope, knowing that God will do everything that he said he would do, but this hope that is seen is not hope. Why do you still hope for what you uh, see? And I think that's important. We haven't experienced that yet but we are confidently looking for it, expecting it. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We eagerly wait for it. We want it to come. He said, but we wait for it with perseverance. We, we tolerate. We have patience. Even those times and situations are difficult. We hold on during that period of time. Now, what that is going to do is that's going to introduce another idea. As you remember, I've been telling you the book of Romans, it's almost like you turn a page and you have to flip back the page and say, oh yeah, that connects to that. Take verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he's going to bring up the Spirit again, the Holy Spirit. He said he also, likewise, the Spirit has some help for man. And that is in our weaknesses. Well, what is our weakness? We don't know what we should pray for as we ought. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you didn't know what to ask for? Well, do you pray for you to go on? Do you pray for healing? Do you pray that uh, Paul said, I am a straight betwixt the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more needful for your sake. Now, if uh, you're looking at what should I do? I don't know what I should pray for, which way I should go. Should I be praying for this or should I pray for that? He says, but there's another aspect to this. There's a word that he has used numerous times in the context, and that's the word groanings. What are we groaning for or about? Verse 18, the sufferings of this present time. And then he talks about what we are eagerly waiting for. That is the redemption of our body. We are groaning in this life because we don't know the right resolution to everything. Because sometimes you may be in the hospital and you think, is this it? Lord, go ahead and take me now. Or, Lord, let me get better so I can have some influence on my family. Could you imagine here is a Christian being persecuted for his faith? What does he pray for? Does he pray that, Lord, take these people persecuting me out of the way? Lord, give me the resolve to be able to resist this? Do you always know the right thing to say? I'm going to tell you, I find myself not knowing the right thing to say at times of difficulty in people's lives. You go to the hospital and somebody's asked you to come and pray for them. And they've just gotten news from the doctor. You're not going to live. You've got three months. You've got two weeks. Will you pray for me? What would you say? Well, he's going to talk about that when he gets to verse 28. So we're at verse 26 right now. 
Verse 28, you, there's going to come up, there's going to be the issue of, of God's will, what's going to be the best situation. I don't always know the best thing to say. Well, if I don't know the best thing to say to you, do you suppose I would know the best thing to say to God? No. Well, he says, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings, not his groanings, our groanings, which cannot be uttered. Can the Spirit know the right thing to convey my feelings to the Heavenly Father? To express it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a situation where uh, when you look at the context here, we don't know the right way to express it sometimes. So he says, I want you to understand God's on your side. That's really the bottom line of this. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three are on your side so that if you don't know how to express it, the Spirit's able to do that. It's the man that's groaning because if you look at the context, all the groaning that's done in Romans 8 is done on the part of man. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to groan. Yes. Absolutely. When he gets to the end of it, he's just going to conclude that whole thing. If you know, God's for us, who can be against us? Well, let's go on and like take verse 27 and 28. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He who searches the hearts. Well, who searches our hearts? God the Father does. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Is there communication between the Godhead? That's just difficult for me to comprehend. Uh, how God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit communicate among themselves. Does it have to be verbal? No. And, uh, but they can communicate with one another, and they do communicate with one another. You know, Jesus, when he was baptized, the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. How when Jesus prayed, he said, Father, and he goes on and prays like John 17. Well, the Spirit is also involved here, and he says, because he makes intercessions for the saints, but that last phrase there is so important. According to the will of God. Does the Spirit ask the Father to do anything contrary to the Father's will? No. Well, Jesus said, I do always do those things which please the Father. I believe it's John chapter 8. All of these things, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, are one. Completely one, united. Perfectly one. Not, you know, not close, but perfectly one. And in doing so, they each are involved in the salvation of man. And one of the things I think is valuable is, the Holy Spirit is a revealer. He reveals the will of God to man, but what else does he do? He reveals the will of man to God. And so the Holy Spirit is a great communicator, much better than any of us could be. Well, that brings us to verse 28, probably the most quoted verse of the book of Romans for most people. And uh, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who those are the called according to his purpose. Now, some people say that everything then is what God wants it to be, and uh, therefore it all works for it. Does God want everything that happens to happen? 
No. There's many things that are done that are contrary to the will of God. But he says all things work together for good to a certain group of people. To those who love God, and he says, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Who are those people? Christians. Now, how can all things work together for good for Christians? Think about what if I am persecuted? What if I am killed? How does that work for good? Tonight, I'm going to be dealing with uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be dealing with verse 6, verse 10, verse 20, and then chapter 6 and verse 33. In verse 10, he says, uh, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on in verses 11 and 12 and talks about what that means. And we'll talk about that tonight. But I want to point out to you that if I am persecuted for righteousness' sake, what do I get? I get a home in heaven. If I die and I am righteous and faithful, what do I get? A home in heaven. And go back to verse 18. I reckon, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's all focused about the future. And so he's saying all these things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. That means that we can work them get together for the good. That's the, the idea here. What does it mean for it to be good? It works out the way God wants it to do. Our response to it. But he said, those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose, they're going to seek God's will. That's Romans chapter 8. You know, the persecution that rose against the church in Jerusalem. And then the saints were scattered abroad. Uh, let me just ask you this. Did Barnabas love the Lord? Did Paul love the Lord? Paul and Barnabas didn't agree about John Mark. That disagreement was so strong that the two of them couldn't work together anymore. Was that a bad thing or a good thing? It's a good thing. How did the Lord use that? Well, Paul and John Mark went to Crete. Or Cyprus, I'm sorry. And where did uh, Paul and Silas go? They went to what's Turkey today, Asia Minor. And so instead of having one set of missionaries, two guys, how many do you have? Two sets. You got four guys now they are going. And you also have... Barnabas training John Mark, and you have Paul training Silas. What do you see the benefit in all that? But if people love God and they want to do what's right, then you know that you can have those things. Now, um, It's good because the providence of God may be involved in something that we may not be able to see what God is doing. I'll use an example. Uh, I have an uncle, or had an uncle that passed away. Uh, he was not faithful to the church. He uh, had a terrible accident right after Credo and I got married and uh, put him in a wheelchair, broke his back. He was going to work and uh, hit a pocket ice as the vehicle slid around, flipped over, and uh, did terrible 
damage to his spine. And uh, the response of the church was overwhelming. And uh, when he went through all that uh, hospitalization, rehab, I think it just, it tendered his heart. Before he passed away, he got to see his son preach the gospel. You think about the change it made in him. Now, is sometimes you ask a question, was an accident a good thing? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, it can be good. And it can be worked out. Well, let me tell you where we're going to be. Lord willing, next Sunday morning, Chad Ramsey is going to be teaching the choir. Lord willing, two weeks from today, Brother Roger Comstock is going to be here. So three weeks from today, we're going to pick up with verse 29. <laughs> That's good. 